Hey everybody, what's good? It's the Tominator, and as promised in the last video, this time we'll be counting down the top 10 chests in bodybuilding history. So this one was a lot of fun to make. It was definitely simpler than shoulders because unlike that tricky body part, the pecs are only visible from the front and sides, and they're only really a factor in two or three of the mandatories. Obviously the side chest pose is paramount here. I mean, come on, chest is right there in the name. So needless to say, this is the pose that was weighted most heavily when determining the members of this highly exclusive list. The chest is also a key component in the most muscular, so that would be secondary, and to a lesser extent it comes into play in the front lat spread, and of course when standing relaxed or semi-relaxed. But otherwise, it's generally not that relevant. And I think you'll find an interesting contrast between this list and the previous one because modern day mass monsters pretty much had a monopoly when it came to the shoulders, but as for the pecs, the golden era is where it's at. In fact, only two of the 10 bodybuilders we're about to see competed after the 1980s. Let that one sink in for a moment. Despite all the advances to training equipment, nutrition, and especially the drug game, bodybuilders from the 70s and 80s routinely had better quality chests than their 21st century counterparts. So needless to say, this should be a treat for all you old school fans out there. Now let's get into it. Coming in at number 10 is the late, great Serge Nubre. Serge may very well have had the most aesthetic looking chest of all time, especially when just standing around relaxed. His pectorals had a beautifully sculpted, sloping shape to them and showed surprising thickness when viewed from the side. The main reason he didn't land any higher is because I was a little disappointed in the lack of detail on display. He never seemed to offer much in the way of striations in the side chest, for example, and I suspect this largely boils down to the manner in which he struck the pose, striving to really puff up his chest and ribcage and maybe not focusing on contracting that far peck as much as we're accustomed to seeing today. But still, Serge had a timeless physique and one of the best chests in history. Next up at number 9, we've got Gary Stridham. Gary had a pretty crazy upper body with standout pecs, delts, and triceps. But even though he narrowly missed out on making the best shoulders list, he gets a chance to redeem himself here. For me, the distinguishing characteristic of Stridham's chest was that it looked uniformly thick all the way across. Outer to inner, upper to lower, those pecs were just fully saturated with tightly packed muscle fibers. It's readily apparent here in the most muscular. Unsurprisingly, the side chest was also one of his strongest poses. I'm not sure what his training style was like, but Gary just had that hard, dense look that typically only comes from years of heavy lifting. And here's a good comparison with Mr. Olympia Lee Haney. Honestly, I'd say this one could go either way, depending on whether you prefer a more bunched up, striated chest or longer pectorals with a larger surface area. But based on this pick, I'd probably give a slight edge to Haney who we'll see shortly. Checking in at number 8 though is Roy Callender. Callender may not have been as highly regarded as those last two names, but he had an even more impressive chest in my opinion. His pecs were a little rounder but just as thick and easily among the most striated of all time. Those deep clefts carving through his chest like the blades of twin fans have got to be his most defining physical trait, and one that few bodybuilders could ever hope to match. Callender's only shortcoming is that he was somewhat lacking in width. This was compounded by the fact that his lower pecs were particularly rounded looking, making them appear even more elongated and narrow. Still, Callender's chest was truly one of a kind and definitely deserving of its place among the top 10. Okay, but for now, number 7 marks a rather jarring detour from the golden era as we fast forward temporarily to the turn of the century to witness the ultimate freakazoid, Marcus Rule. Talk about apples and oranges. As you might imagine, it was difficult to find a spot for this lumbering behemoth amidst all these other elegant classic physiques. But I couldn't not include him. We all know his chest would unfortunately go on to develop that unsightly gap down the middle, but back in his early days, like here at the 1998 Night of Champions, Marcus's pecs were actually even more of a dominant muscle group than his shoulders, believe it or not. As it turns out, his delts would take a couple years to catch up and eventually take over. As far as the chest is concerned though, rules happen to be insanely massive, wide, and ripped. 
But again, the main thing holding him back is shape, or lack thereof. Rule was seemingly all jagged edges, and never had the smooth, rounded contours belonging to more graceful physiques, let's just say. Not only that, but his consistency left much to be desired. As we already established, Marcus's pecs would later deteriorate beyond repair, and become a glaring weak point instead of a strength. So that's the main reason I can't in good conscience rate him any higher. In stark contrast then is Lee Haney landing at number 6. Throughout his entire career, Haney was renowned for exceptional pec development. And after that world-class back, this was undoubtedly his best body part. Lee's chest was thick and full but didn't lack for detail. It was always shredded from top to bottom any time he hit a side chest. It was also one of the reasons why his front lat spread was so devastatingly successful. It's easy to overlook considering the glorious V-taper on hand, but his chest always showed impressive depth in this pose. Lee also presented tremendous muscularity in the crab shot. People often tend to get preoccupied with the arms and shoulders when it comes to the most muscular, myself included, but the chest is really the centerpiece of the pose that ties everything together, and is therefore arguably most important. Even in this side tricep variation, he somehow managed to make it more about the pecs than the triceps themselves. And we can't forget, the chest was one of the major advantages he held over Dorian Yates when the two went head-to-head -head in 1991. There's no denying, Haney was light years ahead of the shadow in this respect. It's just no contest when they're standing relaxed from the front. Okay, moving on. The original Incredible Hulk, Lou Ferrigno, checks in at number 5. Towering over the competition at an imposing 6 foot 5, Lou was a giant of a bodybuilder and one of the tallest men to ever compete at the Olympia level. He was also probably the closest thing to Arnold when it comes to pec development. For one, they were both tall white bodybuilders hailing from the 70s. Secondly, they both had broad, powerful chests supported by massive rib cages that occupied an abnormally large percentage of their torso length. What I mean by that is look at how short his abdomen is compared to his pecs. Arnold was the same way, and I suspect that's a big part of what made them so pec dominant. In fact, I'd hazard to guess that this is one of the main genetic factors contributing to elite chest development, as pretty much all of the top five share this commonality. It would stand to reason, too, since a longer muscle belly is typically a mechanically stronger one, so it would likely be easier for individuals with large pectoral surface areas to effectively engage this muscle group while training. That said, if I'm going to nitpick, Ferrigno could have had just a tad more thickness for his size, and also shown a bit more striations, which is why he makes the top 5 but doesn't sit any higher. At number 4, the late Franco Colombo is another old school legend with legendary pec development. The way I'd sum it up is that there's three things that make Franco's chest so outstanding. It's relative size, the crazy thickness, and that gnarly horizontal split. Despite standing only about 5'5", five five, Franco's pecs wouldn't even look out of place on Lou Ferrigno, a man literally a full foot taller. Just look at how well they measure up next to his old buddy Arnold's. From top to bottom, they're almost the same dimensions. If anything, Franco's boasting even more thickness here. His upper chest in particular is just ridiculously well developed. Undoubtedly, this is a product of his powerlifting background. You don't attain density like this without lifting a lot of heavy-ass weights. And the third and most defining characteristic in Colombo's case was the incredible separation he had between the upper and lower pecs. At times, it almost seemed like his chest consisted of two entirely separate muscle groups. Probably no one else in history exhibited this feature to such a degree. My only mild piece of criticism for Franco is that he never had the most pleasing shape. His chest often looked a little too square and blocky for my taste, but maybe that's just me. Okay, and before we proceed to the top three, let's get some honorable mentions out of the way. Most of these guys will be modern day pros who missed the cut mainly due to lack of muscle quality. Big Rami's a perfect example. Here's someone with all the mass and thickness in the world, yet it still wasn't enough. In truth, I had a tough time deciding between him and Marcus Rule, but ultimately Rule prevailed because when I went and looked back, he presented a way higher degree of conditioning through the pecs. I know that Rami has the potential to be on here, but for the majority of his career thus far, he's resembled more of a diamond in the rough than a fully finished product. 
Cedric McMillan was another prime candidate. Of all the current bodybuilders, his chest perhaps most recalls the pleasing proportions and aesthetic appeal of the golden era. And if we're talking about Cedric at his best, yeah, he probably warrants a spot. But in recent years, I can't help but notice that his pecs often appear somewhat droopy, especially when standing relaxed, and even seem to exhibit traces of gynecomastia. So that's why he was left off. Johnny Jackson and Branch Warren were certainly both considered. They each built some of the thickest chests of all time, and in Branch's case, had some crazy vascularity too. The problem for them is that they lack the width and larger-than-life proportions of most of these old-school icons. Now, some misguided people will probably be wondering where Kevin Lavroni is at. After all, he had arguably the best side chest pose of all time. Well, let's just say that a pose is often more than the sum of its parts, and what made that shot so spectacular for Kevin was mostly his shoulders and triceps, which, by the way, completely overshadow his pecs. Sean Ray had an aesthetic-looking chest, with a nice square shape that looked very impressive when standing relaxed from the front. But unfortunately, whenever he turned into the side chest, it tended to flatten out and look smaller rather than larger. His main shortcoming here, as it was in general, was simply lack of size. Chris Cormier was like a larger version of Ray, pecs-wise. He also had that full square look and obviously possessed a bit more mass and density, but it still wasn't quite enough to crack the top 10. Dennis James had an awesome chest as well. He had extremely good upper pec separation right beneath the collarbone, and no shortage of width. But his muscles always looked a little on the spongy side. Plus, on stage, he never had the deep, fiber-splitting detail of most of the others on this list. And lastly, I gotta mention Juan Morel. He was, after all, my own selection for the best chest of 2019, so his omission here might seem a bit inconsistent on my part. But keep in mind, we're talking about the best of all time now, and while Juan's chest is indeed one of the strongest among the current ranks, it's again that new age type of muscle that can be dry, grainy, and vascular, yet otherwise lack definition. I guess what I'm saying is that when it comes to chests, I just feel like the old school guys did it better. Call me old-fashioned, but I prefer seeing rippling striations as opposed to veins in this body part, and I'll generally accept a little less raw mass for a proportionately more impressive and well-developed set of pecs, if that makes sense. So on that note, let's continue onwards to the top three. Brutal Bertle Fox comes in third. Now, aside from Arnold himself, nobody in the golden era comes close to matching the sheer immensity and depth of Bertle's chest. Size-wise, these pecs would be right at home on today's Olympia stage over 30 years later. But you rarely see all that mass in conjunction with quality definition like this anymore. His thickness from the side was unparalleled for his day. It was like two, three-inch thick slabs of beef propped up there. And in the crab most muscular, you can forget about it. Nobody's touching this in the 80s. In fact, now that I think about it, Fox must have been like the Paul Delet of his era. Just a freaky, scary mass monster with some good flow and unbelievable body parts, but ultimately a bit of a weak poser and pretty lackluster from the back. But when it comes to the muscle group in question, you could honestly make a solid case for Bertel Fox having the greatest chest ever. For my money though, Ronnie Coleman just edges him out for that number two spot. Ronnie basically had Bertel's same beefy chest genetics, but with the added advantage of competing in the 90s and 2000s with access to better drugs. His pecs were positively enormous and helped him dominate the side chest and most muscular throughout his lengthy reign. And if there was a way to reliably measure total muscle volume, including width, height, thickness, and density, probably nobody would come away with a higher number than Big Ron. Ronnie's chest was so spectacular pardon the pun, that even longtime rival Jay Cutler couldn't keep his hands off. My only niggling complaint with Ronnie is that his pecs had a rather odd asymmetry to them, what with the split down the sternum there kind of zigzagging for some reason. I'm not sure what might account for this, it's probably just a genetic thing, as I never heard of him sustaining a pec injury or anything, but I guess it at least grants him a recognizable look. Okay, and now we come to numero uno, and yep, that's right, to absolutely no one's surprise, it's Arnold. Duh. Now, let me just say for the record that Arnold's chest has been surpassed in many ways. 
There have been thicker pecs. There have been wider pecs. But there have never been better pecs overall. Schwarzenegger topping the list is a total no-brainer because his chest was so magnificently proportioned and way ahead of its time. It just had the perfect blend of shape, size, and symmetry, looking huge and aesthetic no matter the angle. Even Franco can't help Myron. In the most muscular, it was full and supremely striated. As good as his biceps and traps are here, the chest is the unequivocal highlight of the pose. And his huge barrel-sized ribcage helped lend him considerable thickness from the side. Not to mention that the upper portion was thick enough to literally form a shelf. Arnold claimed he could stand a glass of water on his upper pecs while hitting a side chest. The following quotation is taken from page 308 of his self-authored Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding, the second edition. Personally, I believe him, but would love to see photographic proof. So if any of you guys happen to know of a pic where he's balancing a glass on his chest, please link it for us in the comments. Anyway, Arnold's pecs have truly stood the test of time and, in my estimation, remain the greatest in bodybuilding history. Alright, thanks for watching everyone, hopefully you enjoyed, and if so, please drop a like and subscribe for more. This was only the second entry in this new Best Body Parts series, and I'm looking forward to continuing it next week. Not sure what we'll cover next though, probably either abs or biceps, but we'll have to wait and see. Until then, this has been the Tominator signing off, and... I'll be back.